Hi, everyone. I'm Ari Engel, the Director of Creative Community for Peace. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to wish everybody a very happy Passover this weekend. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Creative Community for Peace is a nonprofit entertainment industry organization comprised of prominent members of the entertainment community who have come together to promote the arts as a bridge to peace. Uh, additionally, we are also the leading organization working to counter anti Semitism within the entertainment industry and also galvanizing support against the cultural boycott of Israel. To learn more about our work and to support our work, please visit ccfpeace.com, ccfpeace.com. We just released a fantastic new video which showcases a lot of what we've been doing the last year, which you can find on the front page of our website. Uh, we also, we have a great panel event today with the stars of the documentary Heading Home, The Tale of Team Israel, which is about the Israeli national baseball team uh, and some of the American players and their experience playing in the World Baseball Classic. And now as the team also prepares for their quest for a gold in the Summer Olympics, where uh, the, a lot of the players will be participating as well, which is really exciting. Actually, today, the Israeli national soccer team kicked off their, uh, their drive for World Cup and are playing Denmark as we speak. Uh, for all of you joining us in Zoom, you can leave questions in the Q&A section, and we'll get to as many of them as possible in the later half of our discussion. Uh, to very briefly introduce our panelists, first, we have the film's producer, Jeremy Newberger who is the CEO of Ironbound Films and who produced this great documentary. Hi, Jeremy. Next, we oh, there he is with the mascot as well. Next, we have Cody Decker, who attended my high school, Santa Monica High, and paid, uh, played for both uh, first base and outfield for the Padres and the Majors. Cody recently made news by speaking out against anti-Semitism found in the Major League Baseball. And we'll actually talk to him about that, which I look forward to. There we got the, I love how the mascot is, uh, is doing these interviews today. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's um, next, we have Josh Zaid, who grew up in Connecticut and played in the majors for the Houston Astros as a pitcher. How you doing, Josh? Um, next, we have pitcher Alex Katz, who was drafted by the Chicago White Sox and played for a number of years in the minor leagues. How you doing, Alex? And finally, we have Ty Kelly, who grew up in Dallas and has played professionally for the Philadelphia Phillies and the New York Mets and currently plays for the Kansas City Monarchs of the American Association of Professional Baseball. How you doing? And, doing well. Uh, I'm, disappointed, I'm disappointed everybody doesn't have the mascot. <laughs> Our moderator for today is CC Advisory Board member, John Weinbach. John is a decorated producer, filmmaker, and writer who is currently the Executive Vice President of Mandalay Sports Media. John has produced and sold critically acclaimed programming and branding content for a wide variety of outlets such as Netflix, ESPN, HBO, Showtime, FIFA, and Vice Media. Uh, his work includes producing The Last Dance, which many of us have all seen, the Emmy award-winning 10-episode docuseries uh, on ESPN that follows Michael Jordan and the 1990 Chicago Bulls. And with that, I turn it over to you, John. Thank you, Ari Engel. Uh, that was a great um, intro. Very excited to... Uh, a, talk baseball, talk Israel, uh, and, and the two. Um, and I've had the, actually the, the pleasure of, of doing this uh, on another occasion with the Israeli consulate um, and uh, some of the members of the team. And so I guess, you know, I think I'll, I'll probably start with you, Jeremy, um, and just sort of, I mean, obviously there's a lot to talk about in terms of the journey of a film, this team, uh, baseball's uh, efforts in Israel. But I guess I'll start with you. Um, you know, how did this process start for you? How did you hear about this pro hear about this effort? How did it sort of coalesce into to making a film? Sure. Uh, well, like many Jews in America, I went to Jewish sleepaway camp in the 80s. Uh, and I made a friend named Jonathan Mayo, who uh, ended up working for Major League Baseball. And uh, John and I have stayed in touch since the 80s. And uh, as he became a reporter for Major League Baseball, I became a filmmaker. And he called and asked me if I would like to do a film about all the Jews in uh, baseball, uh, which was something he was very passionate about, uh, covering the prospects for Major League Baseball. He had sort of hit each Jewish player at the beginning of their baseball career and was sort of archiving them in his mind, uh, which may sound strange, but it's something that Jewish people do with uh, Jewish celebrities, Jewish athletes. So he called me and said, let's go to spring training and we'll interview a bunch of the guys. And uh, that's where I met Josh Zide, uh, who's here today. Uh, we had a, a nice pub meal and talked about the possibilities of, a, of an Israel trip. Uh, but in addition to Josh, we talked with, you know, Jock Peterson and Brad Ausmus and Ike Davis and uh, Sam Fold and, and a bunch of other guys. And everyone seemed pretty interested in going to Israel on a trip. And, uh, you know, 
long story short, too late, uh, we didn't get to make that film. But the same group of guys were drafted to be Team Israel and qualified at the Brooklyn qualifiers for the World Baseball Classic. And all of a sudden, I got a phone call from John saying, hey, we have a reason to make this film again. So that, that's the sort of genesis. Started at Jewish Sleepaway Camp and, and ended with just sort of lucking into this great story. Well, I love that because, A, I'm, all, I'm also a, uh, a veteran of the Jewish Sleepaway Camp, Sleepaway Camp experience from the 80s, Camp Ramah in Ojai, California. Um, Cody, I have to uh, I'll just jump to you because, uh, A, Santa Monica High School beat my high school, Beverly Hills High School, several times. Sorry uh, you went there. <laughs> they produced literally zero athletes in 100 years. <laughs> Um, the, um, you know, obviously the, the, the effort to create, um, an Israel national baseball team, um, sort of an interesting one. It's not a sport, obviously that, you know, played a lot in Israel or hasn't historically. Um, how did you get involved in this effort and, and sort of, you know, what was your first response when, you know, someone said, Hey, you, are you willing to play, looking to play international baseball wearing Israel's colors? Well, initially, I, I heard the rumor about uh, Israel having a team in the WBC in 2010, and that was my second year with the San Diego Padres, and there was rumors that Brad Ausmus was going to be involved, who at the time, uh, who had just retired and became a, a special assistant with the San Diego Padres, so I immediately texted him, and we had a conversation. He said, oh, I already know you're Jewish. You're already on the team. You're good. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, good. That was easy. Uh, so I just kind of got lucky and just fell right into it. I was in, you know, not necessarily the right place, the right time, but more or less, you know, I was around the right guy at the right moment. He already knew me and I was already on his list. So that's how it started with me. I always kind of, um, you know, I'm, I'm from a very proud Jewish family. My grandfather, who was uh, very much the head of the family, is very proud of his Judaism. But, you know, like every other, everyone else from Los Angeles, I'm very, you know, I'm more respectful of my, of my Jewish heritage rather than I'm always at you know, I'm always at temple or anything like that. It's more just, it was something that we respected. And this experience was something that gave us a whole newfound respect for it. You know, it's interesting because we could go a lot of different directions. I mean, as you know, what Jeremy said, I am certainly in a group of hyper, well, hyper sports fans and hyper Jewish sports fans in terms of like any time there's, you know, achievement by anyone, can we claim him as one of ours? And And I would argue that certainly in my lifetime, you know, my, my dad, my, my, my people, my dad's generation, it's different because they lived through Sandy Koufax and, you know, Larry Sherry and, and you know, the, the Dodgers, all Jewish bullpen. But I would argue now in the current day, major league baseball, it's probably, if not the greatest collection of Jewish talent at the major league baseball le level ever, it's gotta be up there. I mean, between, you know, Max Fried and Alex Bregman and Kevin Pillar. I mean, I don't know, you know, who might on the panel, if it's Ty or, or Cody or Alex sort of can feel, can feel that question. I mean, do you sense that as players that there is kind of a moment now? Yeah, I'd say so. I think right now you're seeing the most uh, Jewish talent in the major league baseball that you've ever seen. You mentioned names that immediately come to mind, but for the most part, you know, it's not like, we all announce that we're Jewish. You know, a lot of people, you, you always hear about, you hear a Jewish name, you know, Mike Lieberthal. Oh, he's probably Jewish growing up. Uh, Sean Green, maybe. But, it, and, and it turns out, of course, they both were. But it, it's one of those things that no one exactly, you know, announces that they're a Jewish athlete. It's something you kind of got to look into. No one knew I was Jewish because my last name is Decker, but my mom's maiden name is Cohen. If I played under the name Cody Cohen, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have had a pretty good idea I was, I was Jewish. You probably would have gotten invited to even more bar mitzvahs than you have already. I was invited oh. to more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about, uh, well, let me just ask, because I know I wasn't sure in terms of who on the panel here is actually on the Olympic team. Uh, is everyone going to be participating or just Alex? Uh, why is everyone muted? Uh, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I think everybody else is. Okay. So, you know, Ty, let me go to you. Um, wh where are you? Because there's, there's, there's obviously the film and there's this great journey with the WBC team. And then there's this equally, if not even more exciting opportunity that you're going to, you know, this summer in Tokyo. Um, uh, let's start, I guess, with the, the WBC, um, you know, for your, in your baseball career, how, where would you put that in terms of just experiences that made an impact on you? Yeah, the, I mean, the WBC was huge. It, 
it was the first thing like out of all of the things that just continue to fall into my lap essentially throughout my whole life and career everything is just completely falling up um the the wbc was like cody said like everyone is not advertising that they're jewish or or like everyone doesn't know i i feel like i didn't know that i was jewish until everyone started telling me that um you know like at a certain point in my life so the wbc was an incredible opportunity to reconnect with my jewish heritage and like all of my mom's side of the family that uh grew up telling me that i was jewish and i just sort of never like made a connection of what that meant uh to like any part of my life so the WBC with the trip to Israel, all of it was like such a huge uh, connection back to my heritage for me. And it's hard to really compare that to other things throughout my career. Obviously making it to the majors is huge and it's like what I played for my whole life basically. But the WBC is a completely different thing. You're playing for a completely separate uh, thing besides yourself. So having the opportunity to do that is something that, um, that I, I think is, you know, near the top of anything else that I've been able to do uh, athletically. It's interesting. I mean, Josh, I think we met, we've talked about this on the, the previous Zoom. I mean, in your experience, you know, obviously at various levels of, and, and baseball, I think it's fair to say, unlike, I don't even know, basketball, where you have a, a kind of a, a, a set of certainly Jewish coaches um and and you know israel has been a player you know whether it's maccabi tel aviv in basketball or israeli players actually being drafted you know they have more of a presence there um you know in your baseball experience how i guess ignorant or open or you know uh, interested were your non-jewish teammates to you and in sort of you know even if you weren't particularly observant jew just like how is that treated you know, it's like, were you kind of like a guy from a crazy foreign country? I mean, or was it just, you know, really not all that much discussed? Um, it was, I wouldn't say it was discussed frequently, but there were days. I mean, I think, I think anybody on this panel, the, the longer we played, the, the more Sunday games we had, you know, the more chapels we had on Sunday, you know, for me, it actually, it never like backed off that the players always wanted me to go to chapel with them. They never understood why I wouldn't, you know, go to them and, and, and sit in on their, on their, uh, you know, their, their morning Bible readings. And, you know, they didn't understand a lot of the reasons, you know, why I would have not played on Passover or why I would have, you know, not done a lot of the things on Yom Kippur if I had had the opportunity to, to play, you know, at those times of year. But I wouldn't say that I had a few people look at me funny. I know Cody's got some, some real stories of, of, of things that would make, you know, your kind of your skin crawl, but, you know, I, I had some, just people not really understanding, you know, always getting the, 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 the cheap jokes and things like that, you know, as you're playing and, and from people who don't understand who you are, where you come from, but, you know, they kind of turn a blind eye to it. I, I unfortunately, I, I, I didn't hit the big old stories that some other guys got. Well, it's interesting because I almost feel, I mean, I guess I'd like to feel that we're sort of past the kind of really old stereotypes like Jews can't play sports. I mean, at this point, I mean, really, you know, aren't we sort of past that, but, you know, Alex, let me ask you sort of a, a different question, which is what was your connection to Israel? Uh, had you been there? Did you know many Israelis before this? And how, what was different about your uh, experience representing Israel than you might've thought? Uh, and what was, you know, better, worse, you know, give me a sense of that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I didn't have any connection to Israel uh, whatsoever. None of my family is, you know, none of my grandparents are from there. It's more Eastern European. Um, I didn't really know much about the country except where it was located and the size of it and a little bit about Jerusalem. But um, the most surreal part is that the first day that I visited that country um, is when I made Aliyah. So, you know, it all kind of hit me very, very quickly. So um, I'd say that that first trip in um, fall of 2018 was super, super meaningful to me because um, obviously I went to Temple growing up, you know, quite a bit and celebrate all the holidays, still celebrate, you know, most of the holidays and, uh, was bar mitzvahed. Um, so I feel like, I feel like 
you know, obviously being bar mitzvah is super, super important in the, in the Jewish religion, but not until I actually stepped foot in Israel, um, did it become uh, more meaningful to me and, you know, kind of understand my background and, and, and where I come from. And, you know, let me, cause you know, in Israel, I think I went, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky. My dad's two sisters made Aliyah. So I've been, been going to Israel, you know, relatively regularly since I was eight years old, but I'm always fascinated when people go who, who might've had something of a traditional background, even in the United States, but they go for the first time and they, they have no context for it. And it either elicits a very powerful, you know, uh, uh, feeling or it's almost like, oh God, this is very different. It's so much more hectic, and I, you know, I, I, I'm not able to to get it. But um, when you are in, when you were in Israel, all of you for the first time, and you're saying, hey, you tell people you're playing baseball for Team Israel. Uh, was there candidly, was there much of a of a sense of that this team even existed? Maybe you know, Cody, I can start with you. Um, I, you know, we didn't really, I don't think we really talked about it to too many, you know, random people. I think the person who had the best story with that was actually Josh, uh, while buying shirts. I, 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 I think Josh should take the reins on this question. Uh, yeah. So uh, while we were there until we went to the field at the Baptist village, until we actually like participated with some of the, the kids with Israel baseball association at the, or the IAB at the time, um, we, I never brought it up to anybody. You know, we were just a group of Americans pretty much walking through, the, you know, walking through the, the countryside with a, a bus with a big old tag on it that said, uh, you know, baseball team. We which, were as low profile as a group of five relatively large professional athletes uh, being followed by a camera crew could be. In, the t- in all of the markets. Like we were, li- I mean, imagine Jeremy and his tight little body following us in those you know, the, and the shook and the market and all that with those and, cameras. And, and Seth getting the really low angle because he's he's like four foot tall. And the outtakes on the movie are funny. Seth made it all the way up uh, the mountain carrying the, be- the camera. The best scene of the movie was cut, unfortunately. In a when, thousand when, when, degree heat. Yeah. yeah, when we when we climbed Masada, Seth was dying because he was carrying, and so was so was Jeremy. They were carrying these these huge camera equipment, and I remember Seth got to the top, put the camera down, and just Masada. <laughs> It was the best. But anyways, back to the story. Uh, we were at a t-shirt shop and we were, we were talking to the, well, who we thought was the t-shirt shop. If you saw, obviously, if you saw the documentary, you were there, but the, the owner of the shop was so excited to hear that there was a, a, that we were a baseball team and just couldn't believe that there was a group of people that were Israeli that were on a baseball team. And it was just, it was a, it, the sequence of events was pretty eye opening, pretty shocking. Um, I'm glad we had it. I still think about it to this day you know about it got political we were talking about you know rights and citizenship and things like that but it came down to the fact that the guy was a yankees fan and he knew he's and he predicted that the astros would win the world the world series it was bizarre it, the guy <laughs> it was amazing i yeah, let me ask you this because look um i'm very proud to have worked on you know a number of israel jewish related projects in my career i'll produce a film called on the map about the 1977 maccabi tel aviv team which you know in 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 some ways is maybe israel's most significant um sports achievement at least you know quote put it on the map how in telling this story or you know try, uh, going after this do you make it more than just jews are doing something in sports because ultimately like that's a one note story but what i love about the film is that it's a it's a human story you know, and I think that's relatable, whether you're Jewish or not, obviously, for those of us who are, it has extra significance. But how do you approach that topic? Because I know, I'm sure you get it. It's like, hey, we should do a story about this Jewish ball player, that Jewish ball player. I mean, at a certain point, it's got to be more than that, right? Yeah, well, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. As soon as we started uh, working on this project, what became clear to us immediately was the people that we were following around were fascinating, they had heart, they were funny, they interacted with each other, and they were articulate in explaining what this experience meant to them, which is a goldmine for a filmmaker. As you know from making docs, sometimes people aren't so articulate about their feelings and about their experience, and you have to kind of work you know, all around them to kind of draw that from them. But in this case, we had at least nine guys that were all you know pretty confident about their background their experience what they hope to accomplish and pretty confident that they were going to do well in this you know baseball classic so it transcended the you know the sort of freakish novelty of who's a jew 
and became more about this sort of character driven group of guys, underdogs that you, were, you wanted to root for. Uh, one of the criticisms of the film is that the filmmakers are rooting for the team. Some jackass in the New York Times said, you root, root, root for the team. And I think what he failed to see was uh, a lot of Jews in America, especially, uh, are sort of hungry for the connection uh, that these guys were forming and, and bonding over. And to be able to be a fly on the wall and experience that connection, both an American diaspora Jew's connection to Israel or an American Jew's connection to faith, which he, you know, admittedly, none of these guys besides Alex were really, you know, very temple going Jews. They, they had hit some milestones, but that wasn't as important in their gr growing up as baseball was, obviously. So to have that experience and to be a fly on the wall, I think that was what was special about this film for us. Uh, and really, we just had to get our, uh, our cut body, whatever you said about my body a second ago, uh, out our tight bodies out of the way and just let these guys be themselves as they both traveled Israel and then competed in that incredible series. All right, so I know you guys have talked about this a lot, but I got to get, you know, for the group, for people who are watching it who don't know, I want the origin story of the mensch on the bench and like is this a gothic character is this supposed to be a jewish character how did it come to be your mascot there behind jeremy well that's not the that's my attorney marvin lipson <laughs> I'm sure I don't misspeak on this panel. let's be real clear this is the original mensch it's right here <laughs> Certified by Major League Baseball. It was the only thing I got certified because I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> listen, uh, how it all started was just a joke. That's all. I, it was the night before the qualifier in Brooklyn. Um, me and I think the uh, our two players were out to dinner, and then we decided, you know, I think it was like me, Nate Fryman, and uh, one other guy, and we were just sitting there and we're like, we need something else. We're just we're we're missing something, just something. And I'm like, hey. Watched Shark Tank a couple months ago. Mench on a bench. We need a mench on a bench. We need a Jewish Joe Boo. And in case you don't know, of course, Major League, uh, there's a character named Joe Boo. Well, he's a, he's a little uh, idol uh, that uh, Pedro Serrano prays to every game, offers him rum. So I thought we need to make our own offerings to a normal mench on the bench. It was something I saw on Shark Tank. It was a Jewish version of the elf on the shelf. It came with a booklet that explained who he was. And uh, I remember we put it up in the – we gave him his own – Doug, uh, his own. Uh, locker put him in the dugout and we started making offerings to him and by game three I think there must have been like a dozen things surrounding the mensch got him like a new talus and and I'll never forget as we made the third out of the game um I'll never forget I I said I don't care who does it someone bring for this dog pile somebody brings the mensch out and my favorite visual of that entire uh, qualifying tournament on MLB Network was watching uh, Nick Rickles sprint out holding the mensch on the bench over his head uh, as if it was a world heavyweight championship belt and he was the ultimate warrior running to the ring. It was perfect. Um, it, it was great. And then uh, the mention the bench sales went up through the roof after that, apparently. And they reached out to me and asked me if I would take a, a life-size one to uh, the actual WBC, to which I said, obviously. And then uh, I just, we just had a bunch of fun with it. We started putting it all the kinds of places and just uh, used to put it in the interviews with me. And I always wanted to treat it like an Andy Kaufman bit. I wanted uh, it always be right in front of your eyes, but every time you try to acknowledge it to me, I would never acknowledge it um, and just ignore its existence. It had, it had mystical powers. Obviously. It did. Yeah. It did. Uh, um, you know, it's interesting not. when you guys say, and I've heard this, uh, you know, talking to Major League, less so much obviously at the executive level, but on, on the player level, that there wasn't, there a, even maybe there was an informal fraternity, but unlike uh, basketball, soccer, even, you know, track and field, because those sports ha are, are part of the Maccabia, uh, Ma Maccabia games, you know, and, and some of the best players end up playing on those teams, either for, you know, teams in the United States or elsewhere. So they're more aware of each other. Baseball doesn't have that, you know, baseball isn't even part of the Maccabia games, it's softball is. And so there isn't this opportunity to sort of bring guys together. You may know each other informally. And I wonder if that was part of the strength of, of your team. I mean, baseball is such a humbling game. You know, I don't need to tell you guys this. And that, like, that you guys were able to come together kind of almost, you know, by magic to play on a team and give yourselves some bonding. Do you think that was part of what gave you guys, you know, maybe an advantage or, or helped spur you on? And, and maybe, Ty, you want to take this and, and go around. Is just that it's sort of the first time 
a group of Jewish ballplayers had been brought together. It's not like this had been done before. Yeah, I think that was, I mean, I think that was pretty much the whole reason that we had success is that we had a connection that, that brought us together. We were playing for something more than, um, you know, more than what any of us had ever played for uh, in the past. You're playing for yourself and you're playing for your college or pro team or whatever. And, and everything is like your goals are so much different than what the World Baseball Classic was. Um, you know, playing for more than ourselves, like I said, and, and you're playing for a country and a whole group of people and having uh, just a bond that brings everyone together. And, and like, and also the, like the underdog factor with all of that, that this hasn't happened before and we're getting a chance to, you know, be, uh, be a group of guys that, that comes together and, and makes something uh, really special happen. And, and just like, once we realized that we could do it, I think that there was always, it was always like cautious optimism, I think, but just realizing that we could rely on each other, um, you know, that anyone on the roster could step up at any given point, um, that we were sort of all on the same page. I think that uh, that really is the whole reason that we had any success at all. Well, I also think, and tell me what you think about this, Alex or uh, Josh or Cody, is that the one of the challenges I know with, international competition in baseball is, you know, it's tough to, con it ha doesn't have the tradition, even basketball had the tradition before the dream team of, you know, Americans, prominent Americans going to play in the Olympics or going to play in inter -comp international competition. Baseball hasn't had that really. They've had it a little bit in, in baseball and candidly, one of the greatest success stories the United States has had in baseball was the 2000 Olympic team, which aside from, I think, Ben Sheets and maybe one other top guy was mostly kind of middle level prospects that most guys hadn't heard of and I wonder if that guy gave you guys an advantage because it was a chance to go to the spotlight that maybe you hadn't had and maybe you hadn't you know gotten the the right breaks um and hadn't had you know weren't given the fair shot or you know circumstances intervene and that this was an opportunity for you guys to like this was your show and and I'm hoping candidly that that continues this summer but am I on to something there or was this just you know me hoping a little bit. I think um, we were a team, a group of guys, one through nine um, in the lineup, just starting lineup was a bunch of guys that had been to the big leagues, but never stuck in the big leagues. I think the offensive player that had the most amount of time was Sam Fold. And, you know, Sam was a known player, but, you know, never, not regarded as a star. Ike Davis was probably our biggest quote unquote star. And at that point, he hadn't been in the big leagues for a couple of years. And, you know, we were a group of ball players that kind of been kicked around a little bit throughout our whole career. You know, jo Josh and, uh, and I, uh, I think we first met each other in 2011 when we were in double A together and we kind of became close then. And then we played on the, we played on the WBC team in 12 and then we played in the qualifier again in 16 and then of course 17. Um, and but in between was, there, Cody hit a few home runs off me too. Yeah, yes, I, I am. I, I will say I'm two for four off Josh with two home runs, but also two really bad strikeouts. Um, so we're pretty even. Uh, the, uh, it was, it was a group of guys that I think, uh, in the history of major league baseball, there hasn't even been 20,000, um, you know, major league baseball players that, you know, that fits one third of Dodger stadium that have played one at bat thrown one pitch in major league baseball. And we were a bunch of guys that have, um, you know, the ESPN article referred to us as has-beens and wannabes because, you know, we, uh, collectively our major league service time was not up. And most of us had been relegated, stuck in AAA for a long time. Me and Ty had been playing against each other in AAA at that point for, what, seven years, Ty? Uh, me and Josh had been playing against each other at that point for all these years. Uh, both Ryan Lavarnway and myself both got picked up that year uh, in 2016, released, and had to go to Double A. And we played each uh, played against each other in Double A that year. So we were guys. Same with Nate Fryman, also in that league. So we were all guys that have been through the ringer in professional baseball and really, truly did not feel as though we had been given the respect we deserved because we knew what we could do. There was a, about a thousand home runs, one through nine, in our lineup career wise. Uh, we were an impressive ball club. Our pitching staff was extremely impressive. And we just thought it was hilarious that no one was giving us the time of day because we didn't have any quote unquote stars, but we were better than your stars. Well, and, and that's my point. And I think that people think they have no idea how just how hard it is to make it. 
you know, and, and in a tournament setting in baseball, you know, maybe over 162 games in a tournament setting. I mean, like you said, these are guys with, who have been in triple A baseball have, have played in major league baseball. These are not just some dudes off the street and, you know, looking, spinning it forward uh, for this summer, uh, give us a sense, and I don't know who on the panel here is sort of most equipped to, to talk about sort of where you are now and what's coming in the next few months, I guess, as we go to Tokyo. But give me a sense. I don't know if that's Alex, Josh, or Chai. You know, what, what's the scoop? Because I think people should know about it. Yeah, I'll go. Um, we're going to have a mini camp in uh, Arizona in May. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if every single player on the team is going to be able to attend because obviously – um, you know, most of the guys on the team are currently playing this summer. So um, whoever can leave is going to go out there to mini camp, and then there's going to be um, some exhibition games. I think they just announced today mm -hmm. uh, a game against Rockland Boulders, and then I think there's going to be a few other games just before the team leaves um, to Tokyo in July. Yeah, and so do we know who the group is? Have they announced the groups in terms of who you're playing against? No, um, who we're playing against. I don't think they released all the, all the games yet. And um, they haven't released the final roster yet either. So there's like a player pool and then, um, it, you know, they have to bring it down to 24 players. Let me ask you, you know, Josh or Ty, I mean, you know, Israel obviously has a, um, it's a significant history at the Olympics. I don't need to tell you, you know, the history of sort of the 1972 Olympics and, and the Israeli athletes who were murdered. But it, for all Jews, I think regardless of your observance level, when you see the Israeli team come in through the Olympics and the parade of nations, it, you know, I get choked up even thinking about it. And so, you know, when you forecast that in your head, hey, walking through, even if it might be a half empty stadium in Tokyo, you know, what's going through your head when you're going to be wearing flying those colors, you know, walking around in, in the opening ceremonies? Well, I mean, I can just say personally that the history, just all of history is not lost on all of us. Like we all understand what we're going there for. We all understand what we are being asked to do and what we're signing up for with the, the responsibility that we're, we're taking um, upon ourselves. And from just from the qualifiers playing uh, in first in Germany, uh, which is where I joined the team uh, for the Olympic qualifiers this summer, uh, the history there was not lost on us. And uh, so I can say that now going on to the Olympics, like it, it just, these things keep building and we're extremely excited about it. Uh, but at the end of the day, we all, I think, um, really, you know, take to heart what we are going to hopefully be able to accomplish and the things that um, we're going to, to try and do. Um, you know, like we, I think we all really get it. Um, let me ask you also in terms of, um, cause you know, one of the things that the, this organization, you know, CCFP, it's about, you know, changing perceptions, right. And that doesn't happen overnight, but you know, I think what's kind of fascinating about, you know, this team Israel experiment, it is this mix of, you know, sort of the diaspora community, uh, mixing with a little bit of pluck. Uh, in Israel. And I, I think, I don't know, Alex or Josh, how many native Israelis were on the roster for the WPC and how many going to be in, in, um, in, in the Olympic roster. But the idea that, you know, this is a different face for Israel. You know, people don't think of it as a place that's going to be competing on the international stage in a sport like baseball with people from all over the world. Um, how important is that to you, you know, in terms of changing a perception that is Israel is not just about military or Netanyahu or, you know, startup nation. There's actually, you know, different faces to the country. Yeah. If, if, just quickly. I, I don't think the goal is to make Israeli baseball the number one sport, right? That's going to be soccer. That's going to be basketball. There is a gigantic community of young athletes, young kids, young families, you know, Israel is a, is a, is a melting pot of families, you know, whether they're from the United States, like you said, or, or, you know, just from, from around Europe. And baseball is a, a passion to them. And I think, you know, the fact that, you know, to hit on a couple of your other points before, you know, we're going over there, we're going to be playing in a national tournament. We've, we've visited the country many, many times. You know, our, I think our goal is just to bring awareness and, and excitement and passion to the country, to the kids who really want it. You know, the people who don't like baseball in Israel, I don't think are our main, you know, that, that's not the, the people, those aren't the people that we're going after, right? You know, Peter Kurtz and, and Margot Sugarman, all of the people who have, you know, brought us together over the last few years, they're in charge of a group of people who just care so passionately about baseball. And 
You know, if we can make that grow and then the, the kids who are playing today grow up to want to take our spots, that's fantastic. You know, that means we did our job. And if we can help them become athletes that are just as capable as myself, Ty, Alex, and Cody, like that's job well done by everybody. And we did our part. But I don't think baseball Israel domination is our, is our end game, right? I think it's, you know, allowing well, the kids. But, you know, the reality is when I was growing up, I, there were no Jewish baseball players to yeah. look up to at all. You know, I mean, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. And then I, when I think about it, I don't think there were. I mean, Danny Shays was the only NBA, you know, NBA player that I'd heard mm -hmm. of. But, I mean, how do you guys think when you think about, you know, Cody Decker, if you think about your 10-year-old self in watching Santa Monica and you could watch a Team Israel compete in the Olympics. I think that's quite powerful. You know, do you um, – you know, have you gotten that response from some parents about, you know, just that, and I think it'll, it'll, it'll escalate more this summer. I think as, as, as great as the WBC was, it's the WBC, it's not, it's not the Olympics, you know, and, and do you think that that, what, what impact do you think you can have that way? Are you asking? I, I would oh, ask sorry, that I, to I, anyone I, else. To the group. I mean, I, I know, obviously, I don't know if you're going, but maybe Alex, you can take that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's super powerful. Um, the message or, I think we have more power than we actually think because, um, you yeah, know, not to put any pressure on you or anything. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not at all. But just over the last few years, the amount of messages I'm sure all of us have received from just, you know, little kids, you know, people of all different ages, just uh, being inspired to us. And, you know, Josh said that we're inspiring kids in Israel. I think we're inspiring kids around the whole world um, in the United States as well. I mean, there's probably more Jewish, you know, 10 year old baseball players in the United States than Israel. Obviously, you know, we're trying to grow um, the game in Israel, but I think it's super motivating for that kid that doesn't have the confidence, you know, maybe, maybe he's not the best player in his little league, but you know, now he sees, you know, guys like us, none of us are Mike Trout, you know, but he sees, you know, he sees names like Ty Kelly and, and Cody and, and Josh and, it's uh, inspirational that, you know, you don't have to be a, you don't have to be a superstar in the major leagues to uh, be, a, you know, play against big league all-stars on TV. Um, so I think it's a super powerful message. There's have a line. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go there's sorry. The, yeah. There's a line in the documentary. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeremy, but I think it's the final line of the documentary said by Jeremy Bleich. And I just love that line where he talks about uh, we, someone was saying the other day that, you know, that we could be looked at as, the cofax of our generation as crazy as that sounds it could be done and he's not wrong we have i'm sure everyone just like alex just said has received an outrageous amount of fan support uh parents you know i've, I've received a ton from people who were in their 60s and 70s that just said thank you for this i've never thought i'd see this and i didn't even know it was something that anyone would be clamoring for so it's just it's really it was a very special experience so the opportunity to um inspire others to do that i mean it's how i felt growing up in santa monica and sean green came to the dodgers right uh, when sean green became a dodger i was the biggest sean green fan and i was what 13 and all of a sudden now i was really proud of being jewish and it, it wasn't like i was not proud of it before but i'm like hey look that's me over there so that was it was a very special experience to have Sean Green. So I'm, I, I, I think everybody here takes it very seriously that we, that it is very, a very much a responsibility to take care of. Uh, and I should thank you for correcting me because I was older when Sean Green came to the Dodgers. He wasn't like in the eighties and nineties and he's like one of the greatest humans on the planet. So thank you for, for noting that. God, I love him. <laughs> yeah. He's great. Um, great guy. And, and obviously a great ball player. Um, the uh, um, just looking through some of the audience questions here. Um, the uh i think also just to cl clarify because some people may not realize that you know this happens a lot in in international soccer it happens frankly at the olympics is that even though you guys are not well, maybe with the exception of alex israeli citizens because of the rules of international baseball you are allowed to you know compete uh for team israel maybe i don't know who's best equipped to say this maybe just talk about some of the what are those rules in terms of you know who's qualified because i know you know there's guys who rep played for team italy and and things like that who are obviously not italian the qualifications are basically if you can get if you can get citizenship to that country you can play for that country so you know anthony rizzo his grandparents are from italy so he could play for um italy um we are all jewish and we can all become israeli citizens so we were able to play for israel 
Um, you know, and that was just for the World Baseball Classic. Obviously, yeah. for the Olympics, you have to be a citizen, hold a country's passport. So actually, myself, Alex, and Ty all have Israeli passports. Mm-hmm. We are all Israeli citizens. But for the World Baseball Classic, Cody was exactly right. Ah, yeah. okay. That's I didn't realize that for the Olympics, it's uh, you actually have to be a full citizen. Yep. Well, mm-hmm. congratulations. And then, um, yeah, and you got to keep in mind, also remember that Major League Baseball has been around 70 years longer than Israel right now. So it's... You know, to say, to, not to double back on what um, Josh was talking about before, but, to, you know, to build baseball in Israel, it's just going to take time. Take time and time and time and time. Yeah, and, and like so many things, you know, success breeds, you know, interest. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, especially in countries like Israel, I mean, where they, they don't have the USOC that can provide all these, you know, not federations with money, there has to be a, a priority basically on based on, hey, do we think we can meddle? Do we think we can have success? And obviously... The more success there is, the more interest um, that flows from it. <clears throat> um, I know there was also some interest in you know, sort of talking about um, uh, one of the issues, obviously, that's important to CCFP is, you know, combating of anti-Semitism. And I know, Cody, you, you had mentioned this recently, just sort of what you experienced and, um, in, in baseball and, and sort of either directly, indirectly whispered or, or overt. Um, you know, tell us about that, because I think it's something that, you know, certainly needs to be heard. Uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, Josh touched on it a little bit earlier. You know, the, the simple things of in a clubhouse and hear Jewish jokes, those kind of roll off your shoulder. If you're, if you're a teammate with guys and you're around them every single day, it's, you know, the jokes are going to happen. And, you, you know, we grew up getting used to that. That's not really a problem. And if the jokes are funny, we're Jewish. We can laugh at funny jokes. Um, but um, the, it was the other things, uh, the chapel that he brought up, Sunday chapel. I think I had, I must have had two dozen weird experiences and only one that was just made me nauseous. And that was, it wasn't teammates trying to get me to go. It was a, it was the chaplain himself and he wouldn't stop haranguing me for 30 minutes until my coach had to step in and tell him to leave the clubhouse. It was, it was very weird experience. Um, uh, I've had a countless of strange experiences, which is weird because, again, my last name is Decker. Uh, Nate Fryman and I once played in Frisco, Texas. I've told this story, I believe, in the, in the documentary where uh, there was an article written. Uh, and It was a funny article. It was titled The, the Greatest Power Hitting Duo of All Time, which d- that doesn't really mean anything. It was a funny headline because we were the only power hitting Jewish duo of all time. So we thought it was a very funny headline. But when it came out... Uh, a couple of you know frat boys over in Frisco, Texas, got their hands on it, and boy, oh boy, did they not like the fact that Nate and I were Jewish. Uh, they made that abundantly clear in that Texas League ball game in uh, must have been 2012. Um, it was it became such an issue that um, I almost <laughs> left the dugout and went into the stands. Security had to get kind of get involved and move them. Um, I was apologized to by the team. You know, they I think it was a weird situation that you know, I don't think they knew how to handle it at the time. And, and it's kind of a, you know, it's not exactly a common situation that you run into. I mean, it happens, but on a baseball field in that setting around that many people, it's, it was a very strange situation. Um, you know, I've had other experiences. One that always comes to mind, uh, you know, I've, I got, when I got traded to the Colorado Rockies, I, I remember I got pulled in the office by a prominent member of the Rockies organization told me about how he was a born again, born again Christian and wanted to talk to me about religion. And I was desperate to not be a part of this conversation. And I mean, desperate, asked to leave three separate times. Ended up having for 30 minutes and I was released two days later. Was it the reason? N- probably not. But you know what? It definitely didn't leave a, a good taste in my mouth. I have been nauseous about that with the experience with the Colorado Rockies ever since. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I mean, that is... Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if I'm sort of not equipped to, to, to say within Major League Baseball. I think maybe I think this because there's so many prominent Jewish executives and, and obviously at the ownership level and, and managerial. I mean, there's uh, what is it? Brad Osmus, Bob Guerin. Are there any other Jewish uh, managers? Sam, uh, Sam Fold's a GM. Oh, Sam. Right. I'm saying at the executive level, it's sort of, you know, um, there's a number of them. But, um, you know, I, I don't know that. Uh, that if you guys a, are comfortable talking about it or, or I, I don't, do you sense that there's really a, you know, entrenched skepticism or cynicism about on-field talent for, for Jewish ballplayers? Do you think it comes into the equation or is it really just like, hey, has the guy produced or not? 
Yeah, I don't. I, I, I personally haven't seen it. I think it's a production. I've, I've been, as we've been talking, I've been looking at Jewish baseball news. It's a website just has all the baseball players in it. That, and, you know, as we continue to improve and grow and, and that that's all over the place, you know, I haven't. Let uh, me ask you this. Have there been any efforts to try to recruit, you know, Max Fried, Lucas Giolito? <laughs> any of well, the, Lucas uh, isn't, Ju- isn't Jewish at all. He's just from Santa Monica and his best friend is Max. I've known. Oh, I thought I've, he, I thought he was half. <laughs> no, he's not. Lucas is not Jewish at all. Max is Jewish. I, I've known both those kids since they were five. You gave them both hitting lessons. They kids. were, uh, they are kids. They're little, little kids. They are still little, tri- tiny children to me. You know, they were both. <laughs> I don't care if they were both named uh, opening day starters for their respective organizations. Uh, but yeah, I, there, I think everybody, I think everybody wants Max Freed to play for this team. No question about it. I'm sure everybody would love to see Alex Bregman uh, put on the white and blue. I, I mean, there's no question that you want to get as many prominent Jews on these teams as you possibly can. And obviously a tall order for the Olympics, but next WBC, I don't see any reason why I, both those guys don't play. Yeah. I, I imagine that everyone who has ever, uh, even heard of Judaism that Peter Kurtz has recruited. Um, so I think that, that no stone is, is being left unturned uh, with Peter at the helm. And, and, and similarly, I think Dean Creamer was just made, uh, was just announced. Well, I don't know if it was announced, but he thinks he's going to make the starting rotation for the Baltimore Orioles. And he's the first uh, Israeli citizen to be in the big leagues. Wow. Or, uh, no, to make an opening day roster. He's already been, he got called up last year. Yeah. To make an opening day roster. Uh, so we, we have about, you know, Maybe 10 minutes wrong. left. Um, one of the things that, that uh, uh, Ari from CCFP asked, you know, if I could sort of steer the conversation towards, you know, maybe something a little general. And, and, and Jeremy, I'll start with you because it's a natural is, you know, uh, in the universe of content, baseball related, sports related, um, what for you was the most influential sport sports content that kind of spurred you to, to to do what you do whether it's film documentary tv series what what what, what had that impact on you yeah well you know I, i'm the one guy in here who's not sort of a jock and i think it sort of helps because i made the film that's probably where my you know my reason detro was was to be the filmmaker but i remember the scene in the chosen where the Hasids come in at the beginning and they have this sort of baseball match and he gets hit in the eye and that kind of you know, that, that kind of stuck with me just in terms of there being, you know, varying levels of Judaism and there being sort of a rivalry that kind of manifests in sports. But after the, the match is done, everyone can be friends. And, and I have to say that while making the film, there was a moment in the film that we were talking about earlier uh, where Josh encounters a Palestinian uh, shop merchant and they start talking baseball. And for me, uh, that was probably the most... Uh, important moment in heading home. Uh, and, and the reason being is, and I think this maybe plays into Creative Community for Peace's kind of mission statement, but uh, politics kind of blurred and dissolved, and it just turned into two guys talking about baseball and their love for baseball. And man, what a model that would be for peace around the world if we couldn't find the things that bring us together in a common way uh, that we all can appreciate, no matter our religion or faith or ethnicity. And, and baseball, I think, is a great one. And, I, and that's why I'm hopeful that the, the goodwill that these guys brought to the world stage with the World Baseball Classic will carry on to the Olympics. And, and I hope in Israel that it, it helps build bridges while it's there, in addition to the fields that they're trying to build. Uh, just so people know, where can people watch the film? You know, Henning Home's on, like, all the platforms. So just whatever your platform is, type it in, you'll find it. Uh, I recently watched it on a, on a platform I didn't know, uh, Tubi. I, I watched it on Tubi last week. So that was a pretty easy way to see it. Uh, what about for you guys, for Cody? Uh, what's your favorite, either sports content, baseball content that sort of, uh, you know, has stuck with you for a long time? Uh, you know, uh, not unlike Jeremy, uh, cinema is an easy way to do it. You know, growing up as a little kid, you know, all I did was play baseball. And, and uh, my favorite movie, grow- my favorite two movies growing up as a kid was The Natural um, and Bull Durham. I always had a vision that one day I'll be Roy Hobbs. I'll be the greatest that ever lived. And instead, I ended up being exactly Crash Davis over on my <laughs> was, uh, My life did not go as planned. Uh, Alex, Josh, what about you guys? Um, I'd say hmm. maybe The Sandlot, something like that. It's a favorite of, of my two boys. Bench, bench warmers. Bench warmers. Oh, I mean, good choice. <laughs> oh, God. 
<laughs> Josh, um, not to get all sappy. I mean, obviously, I, c- I can hit on all the movies, you know, um, Field of Dreams, even though I know a lot of people don't like that. Um, the Sandlot, um, Rookie of the Year. I always love those movies. I thought those movies hit home. But for me, you know, ironically, not ironically, that's definitely the wrong term. Uh, the stories. I, I love stories. Uh, I was an English major in college. So I love reading stuff, but like listening to stories. You know, my grandfather, who just passed away a few months ago, used to tell me all the stories when he played football and baseball when he was growing up. And honestly, that's like what got me motivated and wanted me to keep going. And that's honestly why I'm, I became an Israeli citizen to make this Olympic run was, you know, to, to kind of do his you know, kind of come full circle for all that. So, yeah, so I'm a, I was a big story guy. That was the way I, you know, I tell a lot of stories now. So that was it. For Ty, me. I didn't mean, to, didn't mean to ignore you. You're, you're up. No, it's okay. Uh, I'm used to hitting at the, the bottom of the lineup, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> I, I think that Everybody Wants Some um, is a great baseball movie. Sort Snakey of a movie one. That, great choice. Yeah, that has kind of very little baseball. I, and I just think that in general, also, uh, Ken Griffey Jr. baseball on Nintendo 64 was a huge <laughs> influence um, on my life. I, th- I think that, like, through all of this stuff that we can do, just being able to, like, uh, watch and engage uh, kids, Jewish kids here, Israel, like, wherever, um, it, yeah, just having things to watch and, and be able to relate to and, um, and actively sort of like participate in as a fan or whatever it is, and then try and uh, imitate. Like, I think it's all good. Hey, Ty, did you play as the Mariners every time you played uh, Ken Griffey Jr. baseball? Yeah, of course. Left, 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 you, right, yeah, right, left, left, right, 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 left, left, yeah. It's sort of like left, playing left, Bo Jackson uh, on Tech Mobile. One. It's exactly what it is. If you click left, left, right, 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 left, left, Ken Griffey Jr. hits a home run. It was the, <laughs> it was the biggest cheat code in the world. What's your, fa- what's your favorite or most inspirational film, John? You know, it's funny. I would what say... Inspired you to be a documentary filmmaker? Well, so the, I, I was going to say, in terms of the documentary realm, two. Um, one is One Day in September, the Kevin McDonald film about the 72 Olympics. And the other one is a subject, I know it's near and dear to your heart. Cody's probably available, uh, wherever too. Great documentary called Dogtown and Z-Boys. Love Dogtown and oh, Z-Boys. Yeah. That's, that's their hometown. That's, that's where it all started. Exactly. That's where, I mean, I, I sort of came to this by journalism, and I remember looking at watching both One Day in September and uh, Dogtown and being like, I should be working in this medium somehow. And the kid stays in the picture also about Robert Evans. Um, I would say in terms of baseball, it's funny. You mentioned, I forget who mentioned one of the Cheers movies. I have a total soft spot for the movie Stealing Home with Mark Harmon um, really? and Jody Foster wow. and Harold Ramis. That's not uh, Jody Foster. It's Matt, Martha Plimpton. No, no. Jody Foster is absolutely yeah. in Stealing Hope. She makes a, a cameo. Uh, yeah. and Mark Harmon as a minor league baseball player. He's playing for the San Bernardino Spirit, um, which I, th- I don't know what the team is called now in San Bernardino in the Cal League, but um, they, uh, that was a team that, that he actually was a, a part owner. I, I always love that movie. I mean, obviously Bull Durham. Um, and uh, no major leagues, major leagues inspired all oh, major league. Of course, players. major league. I, I want to thank you, John. You just mentioned you just mentioned a movie that you're one of five people that I know have seen it. <laughs> um, don't knock it. Don't knock it. I didn't uh, knock it. I just said I've, you're no one's seen it. I can't believe you've seen it. I, 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 I thought I was the only home, one. I think Stealing Home. Pro- I'm gonna. If I'm gonna guess, it probably came out in like 1986 or 87. And I remember 88. Oh, 88. Okay. Yeah. They. 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 The Century City AMC had was recently opened, and I think I saw like Princess Bride and Stealing Home around the same time. Um, and somehow but- you you came away with Stealing Home being the good movie. Wow. <laughs> Hey, Princess Bride, classic, classic. Well, uh, for sure. One more question. There's an audience question here that it would be good to get to because of the Olympics. Have you guys socialized with any other Olympic team members? Not for just baseball, just in general, like the judo players or anybody else from Team Israel. And also, like, how excited are you guys to, to walk into the Olympic Stadium that day on opening ceremonies? For Alex or Ty or, or Josh? Yeah, well, I, I, I haven't talked to anyone else um, part of the, you know, I think it's mostly individuals, the, the judo guys or, or whoever it is. Right. Um, we what the last time we were in Israel, we visited, uh, visited the the like workout center, basically, and there were a lot of other 
athletes in there, but um, didn't talk to him too much. But and I guess kind of circling back to uh, something from the very beginning, as far as like just walking around Israel and talking to the people, what's their awareness on who we are? Um, I think that like the the very last time we were there, once we had already qualified for the Olympics, there was probably 10% of the people uh, walking through a crowded market uh, were like, oh, you guys are the baseball team that's going to the Olympics. So there's a, a very little bit of awareness um, right. at this point of, of who we are. The, the fact that Israel has a baseball team, a few people are aware of it. Right. Well, that's about the chance. I mean, Israel doesn't have many Olympic athletes to begin with. So you guys are literally probably tripling the amount of athletes going from Israel. But that's going to be that's going to be exciting. Um, anyhow, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate you guys uh, joining this conversation. I thought it was very fun and entertaining. Um, also, just so everybody else out there, remember Creative Community for Peace. We are a nonprofit organization and we rely on donations. So please make sure to visit ccfpeace.com, ccfpeace.com. Thank all of you guys. We're excited for the Olympics. It's going to be a fun time. I know it's probably going to be uh, really exciting for you guys as well. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Take care.